Um, sadly, we, have, we are approaching the end of the meeting, but don't go yet. Um, I think uh, you, you have two wonderful presentations coming your way. Uh, I will certainly, um, you know, leave you with such deep thoughts, I, I hope, that uh, you will ever remember this, this meeting. So, okay. So when um, we as an organizing committee were actually discussing how should we actually end this conference, we decided that actually we would like to hear um, from a couple of uh, um, you know, speakers uh, about things that we have learned in the past and uh, looking uh, towards the future, uh, something that actually leaves us with a lot of inspirational thoughts and uh, we couldn't have been luckier to, to end up with uh, Jim and uh, uh, Lindy. Uh, so I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Jim, who is going to be talking to us about the Apollo, uh, celebrating the past and inspiring the future. And Jim, you have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I will try to give you a, um, a, a reminder at just five minutes before finish time, if that's okay. No problem. Thank you very much. Okay, so, <clears throat> so it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I think, you know, congratulations to all the awardees. It's so great to see uh, not only the people who have accomplished so many things to be rewarded, but also uh, the younger generation as we move into uh, the future, which is a deed with Artemis and beyond. So we're in the middle of celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo program. And this is really incredible when you think about it, that we have, <laughs> it's been 50 years since we made all those incredible accomplishments. I'm a great fan of Mark Twain's who is purported to have said, History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So obviously we're not gonna do the same thing again, but what lessons can we learn from this as we go forward to the moon and on to Mars together with Artemis and beyond? So really it's interesting to go back and think about what we knew pre-1959, prior to the time of the interest in the moon and the human exploration program. What do we know and what didn't we know? Well, we didn't know much of anything actually. We didn't know its origin, its age, whether it formed hot or cold, what actually the nature of the surface was, where we're gonna sink in when we landed and disappear in the dust as Tommy Gold thought. We didn't know the nature of the Mari and Terra, the age of the surface or the origin of craters even. We didn't even know whether these were impact or volcanic, hotly debated at the time. But when you really think about it, we didn't even know what the other half of the moon looked like. Think about that a second. I mean, really <laughs> uh, incredible what we've learned in the last uh, 50 or 60 years. So what is the, legacy of the Apollo program. What can we learn from this? What lessons can we carry forward that rhyme and that can help us in the future? Well, first of all, we got an incredible legacy. We have fundamental insight. If you look at the history of the planets as a clock, the earth only reveals really well the last 10 to 20% of its history, but the moon and other planets really have unlocked the history of earth's missing period. And also we learned that the from the Apollo program that the moon actually formed from a Mars size impact into the earth. So this is really pretty amazing. And it's a fundamental, the moon and the Apollo program results and the legacy is the cornerstone of our understanding of the rest of the solar system and even exoplanets. So I arrived at NASA headquarters uh, in early October uh, of 19, 1968. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't finished my PhD thesis. I had to write it at night but I started working immediately on the Apollo program and I worked on all of these missions from Apollo 7 to 17. Now there were 11 Apollo missions in four years and three months. Think about that pace. And I, I, I shudder when I think back about that. How the hell did we do that? I, I, I really don't remember, but we did it, okay. So what were the missions? We had four precursor missions prior to Apollo 11. And then we had four missions, 11, 12, 13, and 14, <clears throat> which really set the stage. We learned how to explore the moon and then the last three missions, 15, 16, and 17, were scientific expeditions to the moon. Absolutely scientific expeditions to the moon in both surface exploration and orbital exploration. So that's one of the lessons here uh, that I think we all need to learn about the evolutionary aspects. So science and engineering goals to enhance science exploration return. A key lesson from Apollo <clears throat> is in fact science and engineers working shoulder to shoulder every day. I work every day with engineers and these engineers were interested in helping us accomplish our scientific objectives. And they really enable us to make our scientific dreams a reality. Every mission, 
The first mission, we landed safely on Apollo 11, deployed experiments, collected rocks and soils. On 12 through 14, we increased state time on the lunar surface. We increased the number of EVA periods to two. Alan Bean, <clears throat> P. Conrad demonstrated pinpoint landing right next to the Surveyor 3 spacecraft, which opened up the rest of the moon uh, to our exploration, provide equipment for transport of tools and samples on Apollo um, 14. <clears throat> and then we come to the first scientific expeditions to the moon, which all of these things enabled us to do. Without these four missions, uh, we never would have been able to do this. Each time, the engineers helped us to get better and better and better. So the first scientific expedition to the moon, we enabled orbital plane change to access high la latitudes. We increased the number of EVA periods to three. We provided mobility to reach distance targets. And uh, as you know from Jack Schmidt, sent a geologist as a member of the surface crew. <clears throat> we actually had plans to send low roving vehicles from one landing site to the next in between the missions. Lots and lots of activities. So let's take a quick look at the first scientific expedition to the moon of the J missions, uh, the Apollo 15 missions. This was six months after Apollo 14, and it was targeted to the Embrian Basin and the Hadley Sinuous Rill at the edge of the Embrian Basin. Now, one of the first things that had to be done is to get to there outside of the free return zone, so to speak, and the ascent uh, and easy rendezvous with the lunar module and command module, we had to change the plane. This is not trivial. You, you, all of a sudden, it's not easy to lift off here and rendezvous uh, with the command module. So that's a really major accomplishment. Not only that, we're at the edge of the Apennine Mountains. We had five different goals and objectives, Embryum Impact Basin Ejecta, the Deep Ejecta, Embryum Mare Plains, were they impact melt? Were they volcanic? How old were they? How did they compare? Hadley Rill, what, what is its origin? Is it, was it a river as originally thought? The North Complex, source vents, construction like Marius Hills and secondary crater clusters. How can we date craters from other regions which threw ejecta into these areas? Five complex goals and objectives. Now, to get to these, we had the land between Mount Hadley and Hadley Delta and the Sinuous Rill. Well, you know, that was a little complicated because in order to do that, the astronauts had to do a very steep descent, steeper than anyone they'd done on previous Apollo missions. Dave Scott, the commander of the mission said, okay, we'll do a couple of simulations on that. Went into the flight simulator, ran a few simulations for a steep descent and said, we can do that. Good to go on that site. That's where we went. So <laughs> these were 14,000 foot high mountains, Hadley Rail 900 feet deep. I mean, this is not trivial here. We also needed mobility to get to these goals and objectives. Astronaut operated lunar roving vehicle, the idea of having a car on the moon, what a concept. Okay, how did that happen? Well, science and engineering synergism, really, really incredible engineering at Huntsville and other uh, NASA centers, et cetera, really incredibly came through with this, believe it or not, a lunar roving vehicle on the moon operated flawlessly on all three of the J missions. And even, believe it or not, we landed on Apollo 15 and 20 meter resolution images because we were confident, we knew what the Mari looked like. This is where we wanted to go, Dave could do it. Um, and indeed, uh, we landed in 20 meter resolution images. I mean, you know, that sends palpitations into the heart of Matt Gollenbeck and anybody else who's planning planetary missions. I mean, it's like, what? 20 meter resolution, that's like about four times the size of the width of the, of the lunar module. Nonetheless, the engineers were confident, they wanted to achieve the science goals and that's what was done. And of course, the roving vehicle was absolutely incredible. Here's Dave Scott, mounted up with the geological field maps, this Traverse maps here, uh, ready to go, anxious to have Jim get back in, Jim Irwin get in and off, off for the exploration. And they did one stand-up EVA. What's a stand-up EVA? Before they left the lunar module, they opened the hatch on the top, got suited up first, of course, opened the hatch on the top, and Dave stood on the top and looked around to see, as a geologist would do, what the lay of the land was. And why was that? because we had 20 meter resolution images. You couldn't see any boulders. We thought they were there in certain places. Dave described them and that was helped us plan uh, the next three EVAs. They got a seven kilometer radius from the lunar module, total traverse of over 30 kilometers in an excess of 75 kilograms of rocks and soils. And of course, everyone knows, everyone knows all the details of uh, the Apollo 15, the first scientific expedition of the moon. Genesis rock, Dave, spotted plagioclase twinning from about six meters away. He says, Houston, I think we found what we came for. He recognized that. Gary Lofgren had showed him detailed uh, field 
blocks of uh, plagioclase and anorthosites. And Dave recognized the plagioclase twinning for crying out loud. Um, he also discovered, listen to the transcripts. Dave is, Houston, there's glass, there's green glass. It's incredible. This green glass, of course, almost 40 years later in our lab at Brown, Alberto Saul, in fact, discovered water in the glass piece, which revolutionized our thinking about the moon and revolutionized our thinking about how the moon formed. Uh, didn't dry out, the impact didn't dry out um, all the ejecta, but something else had to be the case. Maybe multiple impacts, maybe a, a, a lateral cloud. Lots of interesting discussions about that. And of course, rock layering and outcrops in Hadley Rill. Uh, you can see Jim Irwin here sampling the rocks at the edge of the rill here. And indeed, we could get with a 500 millimeter lens describe the sequence here and help understand the geology of thermal erosion and the formation of Hadley Rill uh, uh, indeed. And on the way back from uh, one of the EVAs, Dave Scott, <clears throat> Houston is saying, uh, Apollo 15, time to get back to the rover, uh, getting low on oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we're on it. Uh, we're on our way back. And Dave spots this vesicular basalt just sitting here all by herself. And we had talked a lot about volatiles on the moon and why it was so important, so important to sample the volatiles. Um, you know, what are they? You know, could they be water? Could they be what? We don't know. Dave spotted this, said to Houston, Houston, I'm having a problem with my seatbelt. I need to get off and uh, fix it. Oh yeah, well, it can't be, yeah. But remember, we're get, you gotta get back to the lunar module, but fix the seatbelt. Dave got off, fixed the seatbelt, well, picked up the rock, which is now known affectionately as a seatbelt basalt, and brought it back. And it's been an amazing set of discoveries associated with that as well. So there's what Dave calls the commander's prerogative. He wasn't disobeying mission control, but the commander has the local prerogative. So right again, there. again, this really was critically important for the evolution of uh, scientific expedition to the moon on the surface and in the other J missions as well. And this is what we need to think about when we're talking about Artemis II. We need mobility and we need sample return uh, in excess of tens to hundreds of kilometers. So to pass this prologue, let's talk a little bit about forward to the moon and on to Mars. Clearly, as I mentioned, scientific synergism is the key. You, I see not enough of this at the present time. Find the engineers, get shoulder to shoulder with them, tell them your dreams, ask them how you can accomplish it. The Apollo approach, evolutionary, every step of the way, mobility, human robotic partnerships. This is really the road to success, okay? People don't know that there were 21 robotic missions prior to Neil Armstrong setting foot on the moon. 21, okay? And the, they can be really incredible precursors, postcursors, scouts, etc. Uh, and it's critically important for human robotic partnerships to, to be developed in the future. We have some lessons from 50 years of human robotic uh, exploration. One of them is that we really know how to do robotic exploration now with all our Mars exploration, and we've honed that to a fine uh, art, so to speak. The bad news is that we're dealing with humans here, but that's the good news too. Uh, Sergei Krikalev, one of the greatest astronauts of all times, is the Ru Soviet Russian cosmonaut, wrote a paper on uh, essentially um, uh, basically creativity versus determinism. He pointed out that in the International Space Station, we've lost the capability to do creative exploration such as you see with the Apollo, um, solve the Apollo astronauts. We need to regain that. There's a big reset we need to do here. Uh, and in fact, we have the people to do that. Here's the 21st um, astronaut class, an incredible group of people. I still work in astronaut training. And I was very proud to have them present me with this patch when I did my last uh, briefing there. And you can see what it is. Here's the International Space Station. They're not interested in just going to the space station. They want to go to the destinations and explore the planets. Keep that in mind. They are super individuals, extremely bright, highly motivated, and great students. So let me say something about the promise and tyranny of technology. We need to develop new tools to help the astronauts real time look for olivine, look for key minerals, et cetera. Um, but there's a tyranny to that too. We'll be thinking, we want to avoid having the astronauts being treated as uh, in fact, um, just robots, okay? You really need to keep, keep that in mind. When Dave Scott went to the moon, he said, Jim, I was, when he got back, he told me, he said, Jim, I was having so much fun doing the geology. 
that I didn't even know I was in my spacesuit. I was in the zone, like sports figures in the zone, uh, like unbelievable. That's how we need to be. These astronauts are really critically important. We don't want to load them up with tasks, but we want to appreciate that they are the ones that have the situational awareness on the moon. And we want to follow the Apollo credo of T cube, train them, trust them, and then turn them loose. This has big implications for CONOPS, et cetera, and astronaut training. Lots of work needs to be done here so that we don't interfere with them, but that we assist them. And of course, infrastructure is critical for uh, full lunar access. Let me just close with two points here. One of them is diversity and inclusiveness. It's easy to pull down the statues of the past. The hard part is actually solving the problem. <clears throat> the hard part is constructing a firm foundation on which to build a better future, as this is an activity that Greg Schmidt is passionately pursuing. So instead of retroactively demonizing the Apollo program for not being more inclusive, let's adopt a different perspective. Look at what the Apollo program accomplished with the talents of well less than 50% of the American population. Just think what we could accomplish by including the talents of a representative majority of the entire population of the United States. Don't just erect new statues, instead do the hard work of building a new inclusive foundation that leaves a solid legacy of accomplishments in science, technology, and national leadership that transcends Apollo by at least 100%. That's your challenge. And if you don't think you can do it, remember that the average age in mission control during Apollo was in the 20s. So the last point I wanna make is international leadership and cooperation. Let's step outside of the United States and look back inwards at ourselves. The era of American dominance in space is coming to an end. Wonderful community of countries is exploring the cosmos. It's just so great to see, it's incredible. To our credit, we have inspired and assisted many nations in exploring the cosmos and using the soft power of space exploration and accomplishments to build their national pride, how they view themselves and their national prestige, uh, how others view them. Most of you in this meeting probably don't fully appreciate that the Cold War was a purposeful alternative to a hot war, a nuclear holocaust from which no one on the planet survives intact. So thankfully, we're all still here. And this is in no small part due to Apollo, uh, to Apollo Soyuz test project, to shuttle Mir program and an international space station. So why don't we try to take a page from this history and think about what in fact we can do for the future. The population in the United States, one of the most diverse on the planet still accounts for only about 4% of the total population of the world. China on the other hand accounts for about almost 20% of the world population. It also has a very robust space program with a recent very successful landing of the TN1-1 Zhurong rover on Mars, the Chang'e 5 return of critical samples from the moon and the Taikonauts in the uh, Chinese space station in Earth orbit. Why doesn't the United States take a page from our own space exploration history with the Soviets and Russians and reach out and engage China? Now, why don't we just ask China to join the Artemis Accords? Most of you are probably thinking, how do we do that when the Wolf Amendment, a US federal law, prohibits NASA from collaborating with China or spending NASA money on collaboration efforts with China? Careful reading of the Wolf Amendment shows that exceptions can be granted by petition to Congress as has already been done and multilateral cooperation and collaborations are specifically permitted. So I challenge you to be creative with your solutions, emphasize coordination, find a solution that permits engaging China in coordination, an approach permitted by the Wolf Amendment. We're at a major turning point in an international space exploration. Quo vadis, where do we go from here? Learn from the past, the future is in your hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Fantastic, so much uh, food for thought there. Uh, we are so lucky to have you, um, you know, with us and, and, and keep, keep hearing. Every time I, I actually listen to your talk, I learn something new. So thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, all those, uh, you know, wealth of knowledge uh, with us. I was pretty struck by your point number nine and 10 when it actually appeared. And if anything, what we have discussed in this, you know, uh, four days of meeting, uh, that gives me a lot of encouragement actually that going forward those your bullet 
point number nine and 10 are probably going to be addressed uh, in, in some shape or form. Uh, I know we are running a little bit behind time uh, and, and this is not a typical uh, conference talk, so I'm not going to invite questions, but of course people are free to you know, express their feelings about this talk in the chat window. So thanks once again, Jim, and I'm going to hand uh, everybody over to Greg, who will introduce our next speaker. Greg, over to you. Great. Thank you, Mahesh. And Jim, I want to add my, my own thanks as well. Um, thanks for your um, decades of leadership, your decades of outstanding science, your decades of, of uh, mentoring um, some prominent members of the, uh, of the community. As Carol Stoker said in chat, what a resource you are personally. I love your perspective on equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, we're, we're, going, we're on the road to bringing in an incredible talent that we just haven't had access to. That's what this is about in addition to, to fairness. And your point about international leadership is so well taken. That's what this conference is all about. You know, um, Mahesh on the one side, um, Christina and, and me and others on, on this side, um, working together for this amazing future. So thank you so much for your uh, fabulous perspective. 